Well, let's pray together, friends. Father, may your truth inform us. May your hope lift us. May your peace comfort us. And may your love captivate us as we behold the wonder of Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, my aim tonight is to finish our uh, study at Imago Day on the Old Testament book of Ruth, which we've entitled, The King is Coming, while also sh- preaching Christmas, showing you how the story of Ruth uh, connects to this Christmas story, that is, the coming of the ultimate king, the ultimate uh, son of David, Jesus himself, as revealed in the New Testament. Uh, you may be helped by uh, pulling out the notes. Uh, there was a, a handout on your way in, if you grab that. On one side is for the adults, though the kids may use that side as well, fill in the blank. Uh, the kids have a puzzle and some other stuff on the back. You kids may want to uh, uh, have a look at that. A couple weeks ago, I got up to preach, and uh, one killed kid yelled, Mama, that man is scary looking. <laughs> Obviously not taken up with the uh, children's bulletin, uh, so uh, there it is for you. We don't mind these uh, disruptive kids. That's what Christmas is about anyway, right? Uh, We're celebrating the birth of a very disruptive baby named Jesus. And tonight we're actually going to study more than one baby. So it's it's like a little Christmas bonus tonight. We get to study this baby named Obed and eventually David and eventually the genealogy continues to the birth of Jesus. And through all of this we see the marvelous promises of God his meticulous providence in accomplishing his saving purposes. Now, if you don't know anything about Ruth, it's a nice little short story. It's just four chapters. It takes place during the days of the judges, that is, in between the time of Israel occupying the land and establishing the monarchy. Very dark time in Israel's history. And the story focuses on one particular family who, who uh, leave Bethlehem because of a famine and uh, go to Moab, long-standing enemy of Israel. And while in Moab, the two sons took Moabite wives. Uh, All three men died, Elimelech, the the father, and the two sons. That left us with Naomi and two uh, young daughters-in-law who were also widows. They make the trek back to Bethlehem. Orpah stays back in Moab uh, upon the council of Naomi. Ruth goes with Naomi. They get to Bethlehem at the end of chapter 1. Two desperate ladies, Ruth and Naomi. Desperate for food, Ruth goes into the field of Boaz, a guy we, we, we talked about yesterday morning, uh, a, a mighty good man, who allowed Ruth to glean in the fields uh, out of desperation. And we hoped by the end of chapter 2 that maybe Ruth and Boaz would become an item. They would, they're two eligible bachelors. They're great matches on a number of levels and only to discover at the end of chapter 2 it ends on quite a downer that Ruth lived with her mother-in-law. And then in chapter 3, which was yesterday's uh, text, into chapter 4, Ruth uh, essentially proposes to Boaz. Boaz commits to marry Ruth. And now we find ourselves at the end of this story seeing how it all unfolds. And I want to say to you tonight that the book of Ruth is a story within a story like every Bible story. It sits within the larger story of the Bible, that is the epic story of redemption. Now, some of you kids, maybe you've watched the the cartoon movie Ants. I don't know if you've watched Ants before, but it takes place, thanks Ed, uh, it's a story about uh, this little uh, millions of ants, and this one particular ant named Z, who chases this princess ant, and the whole story is about this, this romance, right? And then at the end of the story, the camera zooms out. And you see that this, this little ant hill, which contained some, you know, millions of ants, was actually in the middle of Central Park in the center of Manhattan in New York City. It was a whole story within a bigger story. The book of Ruth is about a relationship, a marriage between Ruth and Boaz, but it sits within the larger story of Scripture, what some people call in, in literature a nested narrative. It's a, it's a nested narrative. And our lives are also that. Our stories fit within a big story, the epic story. And so what we're going to do is look into to Ruth for just a few minutes and finish up 
the loose ends and then consider how this little story fits within God's big story. And let's pray that the Lord would allow that to captivate our hearts. I love when Sam says to Frodo in Lord of the Rings, I wonder what sort of story we've fallen into, Frodo. And my friends, we've fallen into a great story. Ruth's conclusion is this, God has not forgotten us. And that story ends that way, and Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, begins with not God has not forgotten us, but God is actually with us. And there's a, there's a great correspondence between the two. So quickly, what we see here in Ruth 4 are four ways God was still at work in the days of the judges. Four ways God was still at work in the lives of these two widows. First of all, we see in verse 13 that God provides a son for Boaz and Ruth. The writer says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. That's a lot of stuff in one verse. <laughs> I was at the gym the other day, lifting what was an enormous amount of weight, and uh, <laughs> decided I deserved a break. And so I, I began to talk to a, a student minister at a sister church here in RDU, and I, I asked him about his recent marriage, and uh, he proceeded to tell me that they were already pregnant. And I said, you guys are like Ruth and Boaz. In one verse, they get married, and they have a baby. I mean, that, that's quite remarkable. Now, Ruth, you see in this text here, her, her status has changed. And throughout the book, uh, you see a progression in Ruth's status. She was called a Moabite in chapter 1, and then four other times later in the book. She referred to herself as a foreigner, chapter 2, verse 10. In chapter 2, two verse 13, she was identified as lower than a servant. Chapter 3, she identified herself as a servant, as she proposed to Boaz. And now in chapter 4, she is the wife of Boaz. She has a brand new status owing to the sovereign grace of God. And notice here how it says, the Lord gave her a conception. Only two times in the book of Ruth does the writer specifically mention the Lord. That is, as a, as a narrator uh, in making comments, the, the, the characters in the story mention the Lord. But only twice does the storyteller give this editorial comment about the Lord's involvement in the book of Ruth. As we've said, the book of Ruth is not about miracles. We don't see God speaking audibly. We don't see people walking across the water. But what we do see are two key moments in which the Lord intervenes. Chapter 1, verse 6, there's a famine, and it says the Lord visited his people and gave them food. And now at the end of the book, there's a problem of infertility. Ruth has not been able to conceive for over 10 years. And now the writer is quick to tell us that the Lord visits Ruth. She conceives, and she has a child. In both cases, the message is clear. God has not forgotten them. The Lord is involved in their lives. And even though your life might look more like Ruth than Exodus, it doesn't mean that the Lord is not involved in your life. He is, at, he is at work. Now, this theme of the Lord being involved in giving birth to significant children is actually a reoccurring theme in the Bible. In Genesis 21, Abraham, who's 100 years old, and Sarah, who's 90, um, have some problems. They, they can't have children, even though Abraham has been promised to be the father of many nations. And it says in Genesis 21 that the Lord visited Sarah and she conceived. She gave birth to Isaac. And then in chapter 25, Rebecca, the text clearly says she is barren. And the Lord intervenes, hears Isaac's prayer for his wife, and she gives birth to Jacob and Esau. In Genesis 29 and 30, Rachel and Leah are also barren. And the Lord intervenes enables them to give birth, and they become the mothers of the 12 sons of Jacob, that is, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now in Ruth, Ruth is unable to conceive, but the Lord gave her conception, and she gives birth to this very significant son named Obed. Later in 1 Samuel, Hannah can't conceive, and she gives birth to Samuel, who announces the coming of King David. In each case, it's as though the Lord is saying, keep your eye on this child. I'm up to something here. And that theme escalates into the New Testament, as I'll point out in just a moment. 
But for now we see here that God has provided a son for Ruth and Boaz. Secondly, we see that God provides a redeemer for Naomi. Naomi is the old mother-in-law who previously was very bitter. The Lord's kindness began to warm her heart. She began to sense the Lord's presence again. And now the, the ladies who initially were asking, is this Naomi? She doesn't look the same in chapter one. Now all come around her and give blessing to her. They say in verse 14, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. Now, if you haven't been with us, Boaz is a redeemer. He takes on the family problems unto himself, an Israelite custom. But here it's not Boaz that's referred to as the redeemer. It's actually the baby. Obed is also a redeemer. That is, this child will bless Naomi immensely. This child will save the day. That is, continue the royal line, which was threatened with extinction. The ladies go on to convey their, their wishes to, the, to uh, Naomi when they say, may his name, that is the baby, be renowned in Israel. Well, they set the bar really high, don't they? <laughs> Some of us have a more modest dream for our kids. May he stay out of jail. <laughs> may, may he pass middle school. They're like, may he be renowned in Israel. Well, they had no idea how renowned he would be. May he be a restorer, verse 15, and a nourisher of your old age. This baby's going to nourish Naomi. That is, provide for her basic necessities as she gets old. He's going to restore her because he's given hope to her. This baby is, is lifting the spirits of Naomi, who once said, don't call me Naomi, which means sweet. Call me Mara, which means bitter. This baby's going to be a means of restoration, of awakening hope in her they express confidence in Ruth in the, the next phrase when they say for your daughter-in-law who loves you who is more to you than seven sons this number of perfection the whole story's been caught up with the problem of no food and no son Ruth here is giving you love perfect love like seven sons he, and she has given birth to him verse 16 then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Now the way the text is written here, it's, it's essentially conveying this idea that this will not be your typical grandmother-grandson relationship. Ruth is in a sense giving this child to Naomi, not, not permanently, not legally, but offering this son that Naomi so desperately wanted. And now she takes this son and nurses him. She who once said, I am empty, I've been abandoned, now has her arms filled with God's blessing in this child. So God provides a redeemer for Naomi. Thirdly, God provides a king for Israel. The text goes on to tell us that there's something more going on than just the birth of Obed. It says in verse 17, and the woman, or the women rather, of the neighborhood came and said, a son has been born to Naomi, they named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So put it all together here. To a young barren widow, Ruth, God provided a husband and a son. To an old and bitter widow whose family line was on the verge of extinction, God provided Naomi with Obed. And now to a nation that was on the verge of extinction in the days of the judges, God provides a king, King David. The book of Ruth is not just about two desperate widows. It's also about a desperate nation on the verge of annihilation. The re reoccurring theme in Judges 21 is that there was no king in Israel. The first person named in the book of Ruth is Elimelech, meaning my God is king, and he didn't solve the problem. But now Obed will be the grandfather of David. In the middle of this dark time, and maybe you're in a dark time, when everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes, God was at work. Very quietly, his quiet hand was at work, bringing forth Obed, eventually bringing forth David. The ladies here name him Obed. That doesn't happen normally in the Old Testament. 
but this is adding this, this chorus of vo- voices indicates the significance of this child, Obed, short for Obadiah, which means servant of Yahweh. He will serve Naomi. He will serve the nation by leading to King David, and ultimately, he will serve us by continuing this royal line to Jesus Christ himself. God provides a son for Ruth and Boaz. God provides a redeemer for Naomi. God provides a king for Israel. And fourthly, God provides the Messiah for the world. Now, it's easy to sleep on a genealogy. It's easy just to kind of zip through the names, and I'm not going to try to tell you who each person is in this genealogy, but I want to just highlight it because it shows the continuation of this royal line. These ten names listed at the end of Ruth, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's meant to show us that God is at work, God is accomplishing his saving purposes, and this genealogy doesn't end in Ruth. Matthew chapter 1 actually picks up the genealogy found in Ruth. And what I would like for you to see here is how the two tie together for just a few moments. In Matthew's gospel, we see explicitly how the Messiah entered the world. We see in the genealogy of the first half of Matthew what you might call his human genealogy. How he descended from these individuals in Israel. But you also see in the birth narrative, the story of Jesus' birth, what you might call his, his, his divine origin. And it's just remarkable as you consider the ultimate redeemer and king, Jesus Christ. God with us. One thing you see as you try to put all these stories together and you see how Ruth fits within the whole story of the Bible is that history is not a collection of one wretched thing after another going nowhere. History is going somewhere. It's going to Revelation 22, 16, where we worship the root and descendant of David, Jesus himself. And it's a glorious thing to live in the light of that that history, in light of that truth. Now, three implications of the epic story of redemption. First of all, let me encourage you to live in the light of the truth that Jesus appeared in human history. One of the things we take away from Matthew's genealogy is the fact that Jesus actually existed, that he appeared in human history. In verse 1, you see how Matthew, chapter 1, highlights the two, two giants in Israel's history, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Jesus is the descendant of, of King David, Israel's greatest king. David was a paradigm for the Messiah to come, which is why Jesus is worshipped as Hosanna, son of David. So he's showing us the, how he uh, descended from David and from Abraham, the one who was told, all the nations, through you, all, all the nations will be blessed. And we know how that happens as Jesus is a fulfillment of all of these categories that the Old Testament gives us. Well, then there are three generations of 14. Leading down to verse 17 where Matthew says, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from there to Christ, 14 generations. So he appeared in human history. We live in light of that truth. Secondly, we should rejoice in the fact that Jesus, the one who came in human history, came to save sinners. There's good news all in this genealogy, and you might be surprised by it. There there are a lot of surprises in Matthew's genealogy. He mentions five women, and these are some very interesting figures. Verse 3, we read that Perez and Zerah came by way of Tamar. It was through sinful incest with her father-in-law, Judah, that she gave birth to these boys. Verse 5, we read in the genealogy of Rahab, who was, we come to find out, the mother of Boaz. Who was Rahab? She was a prostitute who spared the people of God. Then we read in verse uh, 5, Ruth, this Moabite, an outsider, not an Israelite, in the genealogy of Jesus. And then we read in verse 6 of Bathsheba, though she's not mentioned explicitly, the text says that David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. That was Bathsheba. 
She's brought into the family line through adultery and murder. And you thought your family was dysfunctional. (laughs) And finally, the fifth lady mentioned there is Mary. Now, Rahab and Ruth are outsiders, not Israelites. Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba are all associated with sinful activity. And yet here they are in the, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This whole genealogy, if you look at it as a whole, includes men, women, prostitutes, adulterers, liars, murderers, Jews, and Gentiles. Why does Matthew start his book like this? Well, for one, he's writing to a Jewish audience. But even more importantly, he's writing to say something to us, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. If you are a Christian, these are not just people in history. This is your family. You can actually add your name to this list. And if you're not a Christian, we want to say to you, there is, there is more, there's more mercy in Christ than sin in you. There's good news in the genealogy, and there's good news in the birth narrative. Let's read it now, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus. Greek for Joshua or Yeshua, his very name means God saves. His name matches what the angel said. Call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And how will Jesus do this? Well, the rest of the gospel will show us that this Jesus will live a perfect, sinless life and will die an atoning death and rise so that you and I may have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. You see, the real Christmas tree is the cross. And every gift we enjoy is owing to that that tree. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so we rejoice in that fact. And then finally, we should rest We should rest in Jesus' already not yet peace. It's a peace that we can enjoy now, but it's a peace we anticipate in the future. In the book of Ruth, we repeatedly read of these phrases of refuge and rest, being under the wings of Yahweh. We've read of the restlessness of Naomi. We've read of the faith of Ruth resting in the God of Israel. And as glorious as the story of Ruth is, we are told here in Matthew that not only has God not forgotten us, but that God is actually with us. Notice what it said in verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son. You will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, my friend, by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, you can find ultimate refuge, ultimate rest and ultimate peace. And we believe you're made for that. As the North African church father Augustine put it well, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. John Wesley said on his deathbed, the best of all is God with us. The best of all. I don't know what kind of gift you're anticipating this Christmas. Maybe a new vacuum cleaner, something exciting like that. But the best of all is God is with us. That is the peace that Matthew introduces, introduces us to in Matthew 1, and it is bookended in Matthew 28 in the last part of Matthew's gospel. As Jesus said, I will be with you always. It's an already peace you can have, but it's a not yet peace. It's a peace that will come to climactic fulfillment when Jesus comes the second time. Now, how would this Jesus who appeared in human history, how how would he provide this grace and this peace and this joy? Well, we read it there, didn't we, in verse 23? The virgin shall conceive. The point is reiterated in verse 25, that Joseph knew her not until she had given birth to a son and called his name Jesus. 
You see, there was a more significant birth in Bethlehem than that of Obed. Think about this theme, my friends. Sarah, barren. Rebecca, barren. Rachel and Leah, barren. Ruth, barren. Hannah, barren. Elizabeth, Luke 1, barren. Mary, virgin. In each case, God intervened, and significant children were born in redemptive history. And what Christmas is doing is magnifying the most miraculous of all births and the most significant of all children. This, this theme of God intervening is, reaches its apex as we come to Matthew chapter 1 and we see the Lord enabling a virgin to conceive. It is the mystery of the incarnation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Paul put it like this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem uh, those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You see, my friends, Boaz was quite a redeemer. David was some kind of king, but they pale into comparison to our Redeemer and King, Jesus Christ. He is the only one in the God-man category, the only one qualified to redeem us, to save us from our sins, to make us his beloved, and to give us such a glorious inheritance. He paid the ultimate price for our redemption to bring us into his glorious family. And by the way, this is how you can love your difficult family members this Christmas. Maybe you have a few Cousin Eddies. You like to sew their head to the carpet. Well, how, can you, how can you avoid becoming overly angry or overly dependent? Well, you become part of God's family. Through faith in Jesus Christ, and you allow that love to melt your heart and to shape your life. Christ came that we may know God as Father, and we may know one another as brother and sister. We can become sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ. That is the ultimate status change. And receiving this kind of grace this Christmas changes everything. So my friends, let me just encourage you tonight to live in light of the glorious birth of Jesus Christ in human history. To rejoice in his saving grace and to rest in his already not yet peace a peace that will be consummated soon. As the hymn writer says, the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on the king of grace, not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. And that's where we're headed, to Emmanuel's land. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of the gospel, the hope of the gospel, the peace of the gospel. And I pray your truth would transform our lives, your hope would lift our spirits this Christmas, and that we would fix our eyes upon the great glory that is Jesus Christ. Even now, as we offer this song to you, we pray that you would be magnified and that your people would be edified. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Everybody said... Amen.